exaggeration to compare the recordings of Michael Coleman with the Beatles' Sgt Pepper or Miles Davis's Kind of Blue. Such were the extent of their influence on a generation of Irish musicians. Traditional music in Ireland was at a low ebb in the 1920s as a result of emigration and the continuing disapproval and harassment from the church, which would eventually succeed in almost banning the unlicensed playing of live music. Coleman was born in 1891 in the district of Killaville in County Sligo. It was a hotbed of traditional music, with a fiddle in almost every house, and several master fiddlers within easy walking distance of the Colemans. Indeed, Michael's elder brother Jim was said to be one of the finest fiddlers in the area, though he never recorded or pursued a musical career. Michael soaked up the repertoire and style of the local musicians, learning not only from fiddlers but also from pipers. As a child he followed around after Johnny Gorman, known as Jack the Piper. At the age of 23, like many others of his generation, Michael Coleman sailed to America, taking up lodgings with an aunt in Massachusetts. He soon found employment playing in travelling vaudeville shows. Part of his act involved dancing to his own fiddle playing. In vaudeville, showmanship and flashy technique were at a premium, and Coleman had them in spades. In 1921, he was offered his first recording session. The pioneering recording companies had already grasped the potential of selling specialised ethnic music to homesick immigrant communities, but up until this time, most of the recorded Irish music had been a poor imitation of the real thing. Coleman was among the first skilled Irish fiddlers to lay down some proper dance tunes. The limitations of the studio are all too obvious on the surviving recordings. The earliest method required the needle to cut straight into a rotating wax cylinder, and an instrument such as a fiddle lacked the required volume to record clearly. Coleman, much to his disgust, was required to use a strow fiddle, lacking a proper body but having instead a metal horn to amplify the sound. The tone was penetrating but nasal, on some tracks sounding more like a flute than a violin. An additional problem was that the record producers could not conceive of the fiddle playing solo, and so a piano accompanist was provided. Generations of refinement and excellence of the fiddle tradition came up against a reluctant ten minutes of rehearsal from a ham-fisted pianist who had little or no understanding of the music they were required to play. On the real Farrell O'Gara, for example, you can clearly hear the pianist hitting a wrong chord in anticipation of the key change which follows, while on many tunes the fiddle takes off like a horse at the starting gun while the pianist is left struggling almost at the starting line. There is a maximum recording time of around three and a half minutes per side and you can almost see the engineer frantically waving his hands and mouthing cut as they approach the deadline. Many tunes end prematurely halfway through a section. Coleman sometimes used an emergency stop technique, a closing three note cadence wherever they got to when the music stopped. Not to mention the apparent sound of frying bacon which all but drowns out the music on some of the recordings. So having so generously listed all the failings of these recordings, how are we to explain the reverence with which they were, and still are, treated? What shines through it all is that Coleman was an outstanding player, full of boundless energy and inventiveness. One of the key differences between a run-of-the-mill session player and a soloist is that the latter will decorate, embellish and vary his performance in a different way every time he gets around the tune. Coleman is at his most flamboyant on reels and hornpipes, throwing in bold triplets, a strong feature of the Sligo style, and cascading triplet runs. His reels are all played with a strong swing, and even his polkas are swung. It's difficult to say how much of the influence of his recordings was simply that they were among the first of their type to be heard, and how much is down to the quality of his playing. Certainly the effect in Ireland was dramatic, and in no time at all he was the one that virtually every fiddler wanted to imitate. To quote one of Coleman's relatives, Johnny Giblin, he immortalised tunes that weren't worth playing. Take, for instance, Boys of the Lock. I remember playing that, and it was a very ordinary plain tune. But Coleman made it a great tune. He set a headline for tunes so that no one could ever go back to the originals. It's often stated that such was the extent to which he was copied and imitated that Coleman virtually destroyed the regional styles of Ireland. 
Up until that point, there had been fairly distinct geographical differences throughout Ireland in repertoire, bowing and ornamentation. As soon as everyone started copying Coleman's Sligo style, regional variation was on an obvious downward spiral. However, you could equally well argue that the music might well have perished from lack of interest had he not galvanised fiddlers in the way he did, so that the erosion of regional differences would have been an academic point anyway. Apart from a five-year break during the Depression, he recorded consistently up to his death in 1945, though the peak of his career was probably in 1927, when he was paid $500 for recording the real Lord MacDonald. A labourer at that time could expect to earn $30 a week, though like most other musicians at the time, Coleman could have made much more from his work had he negotiated a percentage of royalties rather than taking the one-off payment. To listen to his recordings today, fortunately we don't have to search the antique shops for dusty old 78s. There's an excellent CD collection, Michael Coleman 1891-1945, produced by Gail Lane in 1991, complete with an 80-page booklet by Harry Bradshaw. Bradshaw has exhaustively researched the life and work of Coleman, interviewing 34 of his friends and relatives to gain an insight into how he was regarded by his peers. The collection includes 48 sets of tunes, along with a complete discography. Of the tune sets, 23 are reels, 12 are jigs, 5 are hornpipes, along with a scattering of barn dancers, set dancers, polkas, slip jigs and shotishas. We can take this as being fairly representative of the typical Sligo repertoire of the time. Most are recorded with piano accompaniment, though a few have guitar, which is far less intrusive, and some also have flute or second fiddle. The tunes Coleman recorded have become the core of the basic repertoire of Irish traditional music, and sets are often still played at sessions in the same order as he recorded them. Coleman was not unique in his popularisation of the Sligo style. The fiddlers James Morrison, Paddy Killoran and Paddy Sweeney were all contemporaries of his who emigrated from Sligo and who, through recording, performing or teaching, were deeply influential. However, it was Coleman to whom everyone looked as the flag waver for Sligo fiddle and traditional Irish fiddle in general. To quote Bradshaw in conclusion, Coleman was, without a doubt, the most outstanding and influential musician in the Irish tradition in the 20th century. <laughs> ¶¶